Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We are working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is Dish Network Corporation, ticker D-I-S-H. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the business quality and its valuation. Let's dive on in first with the market cap. This is a $7.9 billion company, enterprise value of $23 billion. We can see then for about $16, maybe $15 billion in net debt on this business, which is quite a lot. You have two times the debt to equity on the business, which is very, very high. So this is an extremely leveraged media business. So we can see that Dish Network provides pay TV services in the United States, two segments, pay TV and wireless. So their video services are under the Dish TV brand. Um, see, also provides access to movies and television shows so through TV and internet. It, in addition, it offers Sling TV services, including Sling, Domestic, Sling International, um, I didn't know Dish owned Sling. Okay, so they have 10.7 million paid TV subscribers, including 8 million Dish TV subscribers and 2.4 million Sling subscribers. So that's good to know. So you basically have Sling and Dish TV subscribers as a TV telecommunication service. One thing you note with the beta of 1.8 is this is an extremely volatile business. The more volatile of a business is, typically the worse off in business quality. Um, not always, but that's a good sign to think about. A beta, beta of one would be about average. Beta of 1.8 means it's about 80% more volatile than the average S&P 500 company. Now, if we go down to return of the capital chart, this company is clearly staying profitable. So they have one year of losses in the last 20 years, but they've been profitable for the last 19 years in a row. That's actually quite good. The more years you can show profitability without losses, the better the business is. So 19 out of 20 meets my metric for being a quality business because they only have one year of loss. I really want to keep it to one year of losses in the last 20 years. I think that's a reasonable amount and they meet that standard. Now, What's interesting is the story from 2003 on this business to 2011 is very different than the story from 2012 to 2021. So it's two different decades here really telling different things. From 2003 to 2011, we see a consistently improving business. But since then, they have been stuck with a relatively flat return on invested capital. Two ways to look at this. One, would you rather have this business or that business? Well, on the one hand, I like that this has higher returns. You're earning double digit returns for most of this first decade and the returns keep getting better and better. That's a really good sign. However, one of the benefits of stable returns is it's more predictable. So the fact that this company is predictable, they're not moving around a lot in return on invested capital is also a really good sign. So nothing here screams bad. You don't see cyclicality. This isn't cyclical and there could be a big change here in, in an acquisition or something between 2011 and 2012. Um, that changed kind of the tra trajectory. But we also know that basically TV has gotten worse as a business since 2017 in particular, so this isn't super surprising. What I don't like is that recent returns are in the 6 and 7% range. I would really like double-digit returns, and they're not hitting that mark, um, but maybe we can see something a little more redeeming further on. Now, what's very interesting is when we look at our 10-year median returns, though, we see return on equity of 27% based on a return on invested capital of 6.5%. That's actually very impressive. You see this 6.5%, 7% return number creating a return on equity of over 20%. It starts to get very, very interesting. 27% return on equity numbers are really, really good. Um, these numbers not as good. And the only reason this works is, again, because of this extreme leverage that I mentioned at the beginning. That leverage will both help and hurt them, but it's something to definitely be aware of when we assess this business. Now, I have to do a deeper dive here on PE valuation ratio because this company looks extremely cheap. A PE of three or four, if you prefer, is going to be cheap on any business where the earnings are expected to be around in a year and around in five years because they're going to earn back their entire market cap in a four-year period. The problem is, is they also have double that with debt. So the enterprise value is really telling us that, you know, the debt holders own two-thirds of this business and maybe there's a probability they go bankrupt. Um, we'll see if the debt shows up that way when we look. The other downside I'm seeing is this 10-year CAGR on growth. They're growing their revenue at 3%, which is respectable, but assets are growing at 15%. The fact that you have to grow your assets at 15% in order to only eke out a 3% revenue growth and a 1% EPS growth means something is wrong with the business. Now, again, that could also be suggested by this. It could be suggested by the fact that it's trading at such a cheap price. All these numbers are basically telling us there's something wrong in this business, and now we need to figure out why. One of the things you can see that's kind of 
makes it a hint that it's less predictable is that the gross margin is not staying stable. You start at 27%, 26, 25, 25, 26, 24, and then starting in 2018, it jumps up to 31, 33, 35, 34. Now, improving gross margins are fine, but they're not stable, and that makes it hard to predict the future. Likewise, earnings per share seem to be pretty good, um, but they increased up till 2017, and then they took a massive collapse in 2018. I'm wondering if there's some sort of acquisition here that caused a dilution event. That would be my guess is that something went wrong in terms of their shares outstanding in 2018. So let's go see if we can figure that out. But before we do, don't forget to like this video, hit that subscribe button. I'm putting out three videos a week, looking at different stocks. I'm working through every company in the SP 500. And at the end of this episode, you'll have a link to my playlist where I've covered every company in the SP 500. I hope you'll check it out. So let's go to the income statement. Shares outstanding, 2018. There's no big change in 2018, but there is a big change from 2016 to 2017. You can see that jump in diluted shares from 486 to 523. That's caused a massive drop in their um, EPS. Actually, that didn't cause the massive drop of EPS there. Um, what caused it? It was this, income income tax. Oh, 2017 is anomaly. This is again a number from the 2017 in Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It messed with a lot of the um, income tax payments for 2016, 2017, and 2018. You can't really trust these numbers as much. So that's actually not as big of a concern as I thought it was. But it's it's caused completely by um, the Tax Cut Act, which caused some companies to have various one-time items related to income tax. So not a major concern there. I mean, some of the things I like to see here, 10 straight years of gross profitability, 10 straight years of operating profit, 10 straight years of net income. These are signs of a quality business. This is good. This is good. This is what you want to see, especially when you think about basically their EPS has almost tripled it's certainly doubled in a decade so that's a doubling would be seven percent returns you're seeing over ten percent returns from this despite the fact that they are diluting you and they're diluting you quite a bit i mean you went from you know 450 million shares outstanding to 636 million shares diluted so that's one two three four you know like a 40 percent dilution rate that's pretty significant that's lowering your returns about three to four percent than what it otherwise would be the problem is is that i would guess if we go to the balance sheet and, and income and uh, cash flow statement they need to do that because they can't float their debt otherwise um you can see pp and e is not the problem in growing assets a lot of it's intangible so here's your acquisitions yeah, made it made an acquisition here in 2014, 2015, another in 2016. Um, they're paying for a lot of intangibles assets, which again could be their movies and, and different things that they're producing. Um, but this isn't the intangible asset accounting isn't important. It helps for accounting purposes, but the important part is is well, how are you paying for that? And the problem is they're paying for it with debt. They've tripled their debt. They've gone from $7.4 billion to $19 billion in debt over the course of a decade. So they tripled their debt, or they almost tripled their debt. They almost tripled their earnings. This can't repeat for another decade because then you have $60 billion in debt. This business can't support $60 billion in debt. Even if it were to grow very quickly, the interest rates are going to get out of control and, and they're going to get into trouble. And I think that's what we're going to see when we look at the cash flow statement. Okay, good sign is positive cash flow from operations every year. You see the stock-based compensation. I don't really like it, but um, it's pretty normal. So investments. This is where the money's going. Um, intangible investments is what they're doing here. It's not necessarily acquisitions like I thought it was, but it is a lot of intangible investments, and that's tanking. Um, I mean, just think about what this number is. You know, $3 billion here, $11.5 billion, $13 billion. What another four and a half would be eighteen billion dollars. Put eighteen billion dollars into the business in five years, and basically ran up a bunch of debt. And what what did you get? I mean, the income statement went up. You know, it did triple, but then it's gone nowhere since then. I don't know. There's so much debt here. They're constantly raising debt. They only paid down debt in three of the last ten years, and they're already at that much debt. Let's look at their. Where's cash flow? So we have cash. No, let's go back to the statement for, here we go, interest income. That's interesting. This net interest income is, is quite low. Are they holding a bunch of cash? They must have really attractive um, rates on their interest. So I'd be concerned about their debt still though. Something is weird about the amount of debt that they're paying. 
It doesn't add up to me. Um, th this low net interest income number makes no sense. You have $19 billion in debt and you only have 2.4 million in cash. How does that make sense? That doesn't make sense. So the debt's the problem here for me. This is a very leveraged business. What's gonna happen with this? If they can continue to keep rates high on TV spending, if they don't lose customers and they're able to grow, you're gonna do very, very well. That's true for any leveraged business with returns on equity like this. The problem is, is you're set up to do poorly. There's not any obvious thing that they're over earning in 2021 versus 2020. Um, the problem is servicing this debt. Let's go back to the income statement. You see net income of 2.4 billion. You see cash flow of 4 billion from operations. They're having to invest a billion into PP&E. So let's say you have 3 billion left. They're still investing a lot in investments. They're not able to pay down this debt. I mean, if you paid just paid down debt for five years, it would take you five or six years to pay off the debt before shareholders get anything. You're not paying dividends. They're not buying back stock. There's no free cash flow in this business. It's all having to be reinvested, and it's being reinvested into 1% EPS growth, 3% revenue growth. What's going on? This is not a good setup for you. And so for me, I would avoid investing in Dish Network. It's not interesting enough for me. You can get returns on equity like this um, without having this high asset intensity and this high debt load. Um, now, you're not necessarily going to find them at a PE of four, um, but I think there's a risk that this PE is telling you that there's a bankruptcy risk here. So I would avoid it. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.